Welcome to Architecting with Google Cloud. I'm developer advocate Kaslyn Fields, and today we're going to explore developer workspaces with Itopia. To walk us through it, today we have Jan van Bruggen. Would you introduce yourself, Jan? Sure. Hi, my name is Jan. I am developer relations at Itopia, and my job is to make sure that the developer experience that we've been making for you over the last year is top notch. Awesome. So let's start off by learning a little bit more about Itopia. Could you tell us a little bit about the company? So Itopia is all about remote work, hybrid work, whatever you want to call it. Either way, we're trying to make it easier and more secure for you to use the apps that you need in your daily work by putting them in a web browser. And the specific product we're going to be talking about today, could you tell us a little bit about that? We call it Itopia Spaces, and these spaces are workspaces for developers to code inside of. So IDE in a browser, basically is definitely an area that I've heard a lot of interest in, especially over the years. A lot of folks are interested in this idea of development environments in browsers, I think. So let's start off talking about the user perspective. Could you tell me a little about the user journey of how one would get started using this product and what that would look like? So uh, developers uh, may or may not have tried IDEs in a browser before. You may have tried things like Cloud9 or Code Server. Uh, there's a couple of different projects that have been popping up over the last year. We're trying to you know, package all that up into a one-stop shop for you and also to build on top of it so that you don't need to choose just one IDE or have to configure the lower level stuff manually. We try to smooth all that out for you so that it's really just as easy as your admin for your team saying, hey, here's a link. You pop open the link, open it up in a web browser, and it's an IDE. And you just start coding on the next you know, issue that you have in your issue tracker and work on it, push it up to Git, and call it a day. No need to get clone locally. No need to install and do package management locally. All of that overhead is you know, essentially swept away. It sounds a bit magical. So. If someone wanted to get started and try this out, uh, it's on Google Marketplace, right? Yes, it's on Google Cloud Marketplace. Uh, you can try out the free trial there, uh, see the IDEs that we support, try bringing in one of your own, and confirm that it really is just you know the things that you're doing locally, you do them now in a web browser instead. So I really see this as a solution to a problem, and that problem being local development environments on laptops. Could you tell me a bit more about that problem and the types of challenges that you see this solution trying to solve. So there's a lot to love about, you know, every developer having their own laptop. You can guarantee, you know, responsiveness, you know, good hardware, give them all MacBooks, let them all have, you know, complete control over their environment, install what they need, but you run into some problems. Some of them are around security risks of saying like, "Hey, let's get clone our entire code base that developers at one point had access to." onto all of these hard drives that we've shipped around the globe and then recover them later when employees leave the company. Hopefully we recover them and hopefully nothing happens to them. Hopefully they don't get lost. Hopefully they didn't install the wrong third-party software. Hopefully they didn't visit the wrong website. There's a lot of hopefullys in there. And you can do some things to mitigate those risks. You can monitor the laptops and you can put different controls on them. But at the end of the day, the problem is gonna exist if you're having hardware that you're doing work on. So that's part of the problem. Another part of it is you can uh, have like a 25 step onboarding guide for your team for how to set up your environment. And then everyone can just update and maintain those environments. But inevitably people are gonna drift from each other. You're gonna have one person on Ubuntu 18 or 20, Mac OS 12 or 13, Windows 10 or 11. And then on top of the operating systems, you've got different package managers to install different versions of these underlying operating system dependencies. And then hopefully you are using something like NPM to do NPM install or PIP to do PIP install. So you really can't guarantee that these environments are gonna match. You're gonna have these quirks, you're gonna have these unique little problems that each developer is gonna have to solve on their own. So what you'll end up with is all of these environments that don't quite match to each other. And you could push that problem onto your developers, or you could provide them with something like a config file, maybe even a Docker file to specify all of these dependencies that they need. And you can containerize this environment to make it more reproducible, to make it hermetically sealed against these changes. It's a little bit hard to use that. It's a little bit hard to get your GUIs inside that and how to get your aesthetic personalizations on top of it. But 
that same idea of what if we could containerize and that same idea of what if we could virtualize off of these laptops are basically the backbone of why we think Itopia Spaces is special. You're putting it in a web browser so that you can run it from a Chromebook, you can run it from a MacBook, Windows, any operating system that can run a web browser. So you don't need high powered hardware in order to run the unit tests or just do text editing, which is a little bit silly in this day and age. And also you can have that standardization and that customization for your team so that when new people are coming onto the team, they don't need to wait two weeks for a laptop. They don't need to spend two more weeks configuring it. As someone who is deep in the container space, this it works on my machine problem is something that's been a big theme in my life for the last several years. And I'm excited to hear about the way that this solution is trying to address that. Could you talk a little bit about how it relates to Docker and this, it works on my machine problem? So I've been using Docker for a while now. I love using it to you know, lock down my local configuration and not have that drift to be able to guarantee that when I set up my system one day, I don't need to set it up again every day after that. Uh, it's really nice that IDEs like VS Code support running inside of a Docker container, and then you can have the GUI outside of it, but all of the backbones and the internals inside of it. We're really standing on the shoulders of those giants with this service. By putting them in the browser, we are you know, detaching you from the system that it's running on, but we're giving you that control over what's installed there. So we're running on top of Google Kubernetes Engine and Kubernetes, and we're actually running on top of this open source platform called Selkies. So if anyone wants to check out the platform for how we're doing these per user sessions and how we're defining them, check it out on GitHub. Uh, it's pretty cool. It was invented inside of Google, and then it's been brought outside into the open source world. Everything that we do on top of you know, virtualization and containerization is really powered by that. So if you want to check it out, that's a, a really powerful tool for a variety of things, not just for IDEs, but for you know, video game streaming, or if you wanted to do 3D graphics editing or animation, if you want to have the persistence of having a stateful user session in Kubernetes, this automates a lot of that for you. So Selkies, the open source project, is for user sessions and creating user sessions using Kubernetes. Is that a good way to describe it? Uh, it's essentially, if you're going to have you know, any sort of SSO where you get access to a remote session or a remote server, and you're going to want to make sure that you don't just get a different IP address every single time that you're popping in there, to have that stateful session, and also to be able to stream what you need out of that pod, Selkies is going to help out a lot with that. It's really nice that this solution is built on an open source solution, so people can go check out how it works and actually contribute to it if they see something that they need or they have some other use case where they think that functionality might be useful. I also want to dive a little bit deeper into the Google Cloud components of this architecture. You mentioned GKE. What other components of Google Cloud are you all using and how do they fit into the architecture of how you actually deliver this service? Right. So the end ex user experience, really, you have no idea that you're running on tip or Kubernetes. You don't know that it's even running on Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, all you need to know is that when you connect to the space, you connect to the space. But what's happening under the hood is that we are automating and orchestrating the setup of these Kubernetes clusters, You know, the provisioning of new custom resources with a control plane that exposes a really lightweight GraphQL API. And that's all running on top of Cloud Run. We really like Cloud Run for its serverless ability, uh, how well it scales, how lightweight it is for us to maintain. And then those Cloud Run microservices are controlling the GKE clusters and telling them what to do so that we don't need to be in there with wrenches on the daily configuring custom resources. What I think is really cool about this architecture is basically you're providing this managed kind of serverless, in a sense, uh, managed service to your users that is built on top of these managed services in Google Cloud, like GKE and Cloud Run. So from a user's perspective, there might as well not be servers. You're just using the provided service. Um, but then underneath, you're actually using GKE and Cloud Run to accomplish that. So can you talk a little bit more about how GKE and Cloud Run fit into um, the architecture and the control plane that you were talking about? Sure. So we think that Kubernetes is a really powerful engine for providing end user services, for providing you know, the backbone of what your company is going to be shipping. Uh, and that's why we use it. We think that it has really powerful networking controls so that we can provide VPC peering, so that we can provide firewall configuration for what your actual spaces are 
you know, what packets are going in and out of them. You want to be able to control that as an enterprise. And Kubernetes gives us that level of, you know, fine-grained control and fine-grained access permissions so that you know that only the people that you're providing access to are getting ACL'd into the right pods. But when we're actually packaging all that up and getting it out the door, we don't need Kubernetes for that. We don't need Kubernetes to do you know, our DevOps work. We don't need Kubernetes to do our API server. And so instead, we just throw all that in Cloud Run. It's lighter weight. It's easier for us to administrate. And in general, it just has less overhead, both financially and developer uh, you know, administratively. Awesome. And one thing I want to ask is, I'm sure this pattern of running a managed service using Google Cloud Services is a pretty common one. What kinds of advice would you have for anyone who's trying to run a service on top of something like Cloud Run and GKE? Sure. Uh, I would say don't make the same mistake we did, which is splitting up into a million microservices from day one. Uh, we got really excited about Cloud Run. We were like, oh, we could have microservice that does this, microservice that does this. And you've probably heard it a lot of times by now if you are in the microservice space, but uh, you can split them up a little bit later. You can start with something a little bit more you know, self-contained. Uh, we ended up having more connections and interactions between Cloud Run microservices than I think we needed. Um, but we got there eventually. It just took us a little bit longer than if we'd started with a monolithic Cloud Run service and broken it up as necessary as we went along. That's such an interesting journey because we're always talking about convert to microservices and microservices are great. You can use them with containers. They're cloud native. Um, but it's interesting to see the opposite angle here, kind of, of when you have microservices that are true, too prolific to begin with, you don't really have the excuse to start learning the tools <laughs> a little bit slower, which you do with the monolith, I guess. Yeah, we just got a little too excited, as developers can get. Uh, we saw a shiny new toy that we could build our architecture on top of, and we wanted to use every little bit of feature set that it had. So in hindsight, we went a little bit overboard, but hey, that's how you learn. Uh, we've learned a lot of things. You know, I feel like that happens with developers a lot where you get really excited about adopting a new technology and you go a little bit overboard on it. I kind of did that with you know, running Docker locally and having Docker test desktop be running every single one of my dev projects. I had a Docker file for this project, a Docker file for this project. And anytime that I needed to do like a Docker desktop update or maybe get a subscription for it, I was suddenly like locked into this weird ecosystem that wasn't fully fleshed out. <laughs> so the year of the Docker desktop never really manifested for development environments, I feel like, uh, kind of in the same way that it's nice to run someone else's managed service built on Linux. Here with Itopia Spaces, you can run on top of someone else's managed service that's built with Docker and Kubernetes. So yeah, you can have that containerization and you can have the level of you know, personalization on top with your team's config layers and then the operating system updates managed by us, but you don't need to be on the hook to maintain all of the things that you made in one excited afternoon for your team. And if people want to try out this solution, how can people learn more about Itopia and also Selkies, the open source project that you mentioned? Yeah, so if you want to try out our IDE in a browser, dip your toes in a little bit, go to itopiaspaces.com and you can sign up for the free trial through the Google Cloud Marketplace as well. Uh, for Selkies, that's all open source on GitHub. So if you want to check out the Selkies organization and repos, I'll link them in the doobly-doo somehow in this video. Thank you so much, Jan. I learned a lot today about developer workspaces with Itopia. Thanks for having me, Kaslin. And if you want to check out any of those links that we mentioned in the video today, be sure to check out the description below and be sure to like and subscribe to get more videos from Architecting with Google Cloud.